High five somebody and tell them he'll do just what he said. That means we've got nothing to worry about. Because if the Lord said it, then that settles it. You can count on it. Amen. You can take that to the bank. He'll do just what he said. Come on, let's give God a praise in this place on tonight. And while we're praising God, help me praise God for this tremendous leader, this world shaper and tremendous, amen, instrument of God, the bishop, amen. Come on, let's give God praise for him, Bishop Evans, amen, amen. It is a joy to be with you and uh, it is an honor uh, to just stand in this great place. I shared with Bishop, I used to spend my summers uh, as a kid coming up to visit my family in Jersey, uh, but more, nor, more near Newark. And I, I never lived, I never actually even ventured into South Jersey, but what a beautiful place. And it's an honor to be with you on tonight. Amen. Amen. I, I want to get right to the word of God. Uh, I know how you all flow here. You don't take a whole bunch of time. Amen. Uh, because you, you want to get right to the point, and that's to hear from the Lord and to celebrate his goodness and his presence. And uh, what a great opportunity to stand before you. Such a great church. And um, I'm just really in awe. I could have just helped serve communion and help baptize some people. I, I would have been fine doing that, but it is an honor to stand here where this tremendous man stands every Sunday. What a tremendous leader, teacher, preacher, business mind. Amen. Amen. But the mere fact that uh, he invited me, a little guy from, uh, from Birmingham, I'm, I'm honored and humbled at the same time. I've been in much prayer uh, about my time with you. Uh, in fact, um, this has been kind of a busy season for me. I just got back from South Africa on last week and flew from South Africa directly to New York uh, to do uh, a taping there in New York and then went home and then also while I was traveling I, I turned 40 I, I celebrated my 40th birthday amen and um, hallelujah uh, and I got home amen Bishop amen I got home and then my family and our church had a surprise a uh, surprise birthday party for me, and uh, it's just been a busy time, but I just felt such, a, such an assignment and a leading of God to be with you. And so I want to ask you, first of all, to grab your Bible, and while you're grabbing your Bible, let's just go to God in prayer. Father, I, I thank you for just allowing me to be here. I thank you for such a great church and such great people and such a great occasion to baptize new believers but to also celebrate your broken body and the blood that even gives us the ability to be alive and so God we honor you in this place tonight we we glorify you we lift you up we magnify your name for truly you are worthy to be praised now, Lord, I can do absolutely nothing apart from you. And I pray that you would stand up in me and speak through me for one reason only, and that is for your glory. It's in Jesus' name that we pray. And those who agree, say amen. 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 Grab your Bibles, and I want you to go with me to the gospel according uh, to John. John chapter 21. The Lord's placed this heavy on my heart. I asked Bishop, what is, what is the assignment? He said, share what God has given you. And I want to do that. I'm grateful for um, the book, The People Factor, that's been impacting the lives of people around the world and so honored to be able to bring that tonight. But I, I don't really feel led to share from that. You can pick up the book and uh, pray for me as I'm writing the next book now. Um, but, but I sense that this word is going to be <clears throat> an answer to prayer. For some, it's going to be insight, wisdom for others, and, and dare I even say prophetic for some of you. But I want to share what the Lord has given me, and I want to be obedient. John chapter 21, beginning at verse number 1. 
John chapter 21, beginning at verse number one, and I'm reading from the New International Version of God's Holy Word. I don't know what the standard of the house is. This is kind of my old faithful that I've traveled with. We've seen God do some great things through this Bible. Amen. Amen. So this is the NIV. Just uh, follow along with me in whatever translation you have. It says, afterward, Jesus appeared again to his disciples by the sea of Tiberias, and it happened this way. Simon... Peter, Thomas called Didymus, Nathaniel from Canaan and Galilee, and the sons of Zebedee and two other disciples were together. I'm going out to fish, Simon Peter told them, and they said, well, we, we'll go with you. So they went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught nothing. Early in the morning, Jesus stood on the shore, but the disciples did not realize that it was Jesus. And, and, and he called out to them, friends, haven't you any fish? No, they answered. You could hear the attitude too, can't you? No. He said, well, throw your net on the right side of the boat and you will find some. When they did, they were unable to haul in the net because of the large number of fish. And then the disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, it is the Lord. And as soon as Simon Peter heard him say it is the Lord, he wrapped his outer garment around him for he had taken it off and jumped into the water. The other disciples followed in the boat towing the net full of fish for they were not far from the shore about a hundred yards. And when they landed... Look at this. They saw a fire of burning coals there with fish on it and some bread. And, and Jesus said to them, bring some of the fish that you have just caught. Simon and Peter climbed aboard and dragged. The net ashore was full of large fish, 153, but even with so many, the net was not torn. Jesus said, come and have breakfast. But none of the disciples dared ask him, who are you? They knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and here it is, took the bread and gave it to him and did the same with the fish. This was now the third time that Jesus appeared to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. As you take your seat, look at someone near you and tell them you're in a struggle for greatness. You look at somebody else and tell them you're in a struggle for greatness. You're in a struggle for greatness. I sense that I must be touching a vein in the spirit already. You're in a struggle for greatness. I, I, I'm honored, as I said a moment ago, to be here, particularly during this occasion. I think that there is nothing more sacred and special than the celebration of those that are new to the family of faith. And for us as people of God to gather around the table this table that really is the core and the crux and the center of our faith that celebrates the, the body and the blood of our risen Savior, Jesus the Christ. And, and he says, he says, as often as you do it, you don't necessarily only have to do it on the first Sunday. You don't even have to do it only on a Sunday. He just says, do it as many times as you like. But he, there's one qualifier. He says, as often as you do it, do it in remembrance of me and just that one verse alone is is power packed it carries so much when he says to do it in remembrance of me because there's so many things that we could remember we could we could remember and reflect on his sacrifice we could remember and we could reflect on the power that we have as believers because we are in him Christ said, this is no longer I that live, but Christ that lives in me. There's so much that we could spend time reflecting and remembering. But for our time tonight, I, I want us to remember and, and really reflect on the fact that one of the things that, that communion teaches us is that God does great things in unexpected ways. I, I think that's something that we, we have to reflect on because even as uh, this wonderful choir minister, they, they ministered to us talking about the word of God. And if the Lord said it, you, you can settle it. He, you can count on it because he's going to do just what he said. But, but here's the issue. He will do just what he said, but he won't do it often the way that we expect him to do it. 
I don't expect y'all to really give God praise on that one, but, but, but I want you to understand that because what God is more concerned about is not just where he's trying to get us, but what he's also trying to do in us. This is often why when I hear people talking about the vision that God has for them or for their family, one of the things that we misunderstand is that vision is progressive. Meaning that before you possess it, vision has to possess you. Meaning that sometimes God won't do it immediately or quickly because he's first got to do the work in us. I'm reminded of the Apostle Paul in Philippians 3. We, we, know, we know parts of that verse in Philippians where we get to the part when he says, forgetting those things that are behind I press towards the mark of the prize of the high calling. But, but even before he gets to that verse in, in Philippians 3 and 12, he says, not that I've already attained it or either am already perfect, but I follow after it that I may apprehend, get this, that which apprehended me. Paul is saying it's almost as if Jesus plays tag with us sometimes, that, that he comes and finds us where we are plays tag and says tag you're it and takes off running because he wants us to follow him Paul Paul says if you really want me to sum up my life the truth is I was apprehended by Christ on the Damascus road and the rest of my life is that I've been trying to apprehend that which apprehended me I, I've been trying to just grasp that which grasped me I, I've been trying to get to that which got to me. Do you hear what I'm trying to tell you? Because you're in a struggle for greatness. But, but the problem, the problem when you are going through that process, like the Apostle Paul describes, the problem is, Bishop, is that many believers, they often, uh, in the middle of that process, play what I call the hokey pokey with God. I'm sure you don't know what the hokey pokey is. I know that this is an anointed place where nothing sacred dare roll off your lips but but growing up in the south as a kid we used to play this game called the hokey pokey you put your left foot in you put your left foot out you put your right foot in and you oh you do know that song ah see i really believe that that, that the challenge with, with what God wants to do in our lives often is that we, we play the hokey pokey with God because we are believers in name. But as we are on the road, when God is doing stuff in us, when we are pursuing that which, which, which apprehended us, often the times get challenging and difficulty and, and difficult. And so we ultimately kind of just step in and step out. We will step in on Sunday. We'll put our right foot in on Sunday and... Then when Monday or Tuesday comes and the going gets rough, then we put our right foot out. We, 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 we play the hokey pokey with God. And Jesus was, was really trying to tell us that that's not the way to go. In Luke 9, he, he says in Luke 9 and verse 62, he says, No one who puts their hand to the plow and looks back is, is fit for service in the kingdom. One translation says it's good for nothing. He says that, that when you connect with me, I want you to be all the way in. I don't, I don't want you to play with me. I don't want you to be some timing. Uh, you're not going to get where I'm trying to take you if you're not fully invested. But this is the challenge. This is the challenge with, with, with many of us tonight. And this is why I said in the, moment, in the beginning that this is going to be a little bit prophetic because I know you don't know me and I don't know you, but God has given me insight into to where some of us are tonight. And it's the same place where, where many, many believers are in the body of Christ. It's the same place where Peter is in, in John chapter 21. And it's interesting because when you study uh, the ministry of Jesus, particularly in how he relates to Peter, Jesus only calls Peter, Peter, a couple of times, once or twice, depending on what translation of the Bible you read. He really, the majority of the time, calls him Simon, or calls him Simon Peter. The narrator, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they will call him Peter. But Jesus only calls him Peter once or twice. Most translations have it, have it twice. He only calls him Peter twice. Why? Because Simon is the name that denotes where he's been. Peter is the name that denotes where he's going. So often, Jesus would call him not Peter. He would call him Simon Peter because he knew that, that Peter had one foot in his past and another foot 
in his destiny. I'm coming to talk to some of you tonight. And in the middle of where you are, some of us got one foot where we've been and another foot where we're going. And in between your past and your future is the struggle for greatness. This is, this is not a highlight time in Peter's life. I, I know that Peter in the book of Acts is going to be a stellar disciple. But, but this is a low moment in Peter's life because, because Peter is in the struggle for greatness. He's, he's frustrated. And, and, and Peter just says, you know what? Forget it. I, I'm, I'm just going to go back fishing. He says, you know what? This is a low moment. Uh, nobody, I think, is really paying attention to me. I'm frustrated. I'm angry. I'm a little disappointed. And so I'm just going to go fishing. Translation, forget this ministry thing. Uh, uh, people just let me down so I'm just going to go fishing and, and Lord knows can I just talk to myself for a second Lord knows I know none of you have been this way but, but, but Lord knows that I know how Peter feels I, I've been there I know you haven't but, but I've been there I've been there sometimes when, 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 when people tell you that they love you and they really are just trying to set you up for failure Lord, Lord knows sometimes I felt like Peter and I wanted to say you know what Jesus you can have this ministry thing I just want to go back fishing you know when there's more lying and treachery sometimes an arrogance in the body of Christ than there is in the world some I know y'all don't know what I'm talking about but sometimes I've just felt like saying Lord I just want to I just want to go back fishing do you hear what I'm trying to tell you because sometimes you don't want to put on a good face and smile and pray for those that despitefully use you sometimes you want to take this off and say now wait a minute now he saved me from the streets but I go back there if I need to sometimes you don't some, sometimes you want to say Jesus I, I just want to go back fishing Peter says forget it forget it forget it Peter says I'm I, I, I'm going back fishing and I'm here to talk to somebody tonight you're in that place you may not be able to shout on this one tonight you may just have to cry quietly because that's where you are. Maybe it's in the marriage. Maybe it's in the business. Maybe, maybe it's in another area of your life. But your, your prayer just this morning was, God, I really just want to go back fishing. You know what? And God brought me all the way here to tell you, you're just in a struggle for greatness. But because I want to give you two things and I'll quickly get out of your way. This struggle for greatness, what, what's involved in it, Pastor Van? Well, number one, it's a struggle to not go back. It's a struggle to not go back. This is one of the most frustrating times in Peter's life. And the reason that it's frustrating is because the Messiah, the Kurios Christos, the Weos Tutheu, the, the, the one that they had longed, awaited, they, they, they had no idea that he was going to be crucified. They, they had no idea that he was going to have to, 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 to carry that cross down the Via Della Rosa. They, they had no idea that he was going to have to go through what he, what he went through. And so because of the frustration, because things didn't work out the way that Peter expected, that's why he goes back fishing. Because Peter didn't expect for Jesus to have to go to the cross. This is why if you remember when, when Jesus is alive doing earthly ministry, at one point he calls the disciples together. He says, hey, what's the word on the street? Who do men say that I am? And, and nobody, nobody gets it but Peter. Some say, well, you know, maybe John the Baptist reincarnated or Elijah. And Peter says, no, 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 I know who you are. I know who you are. You, 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 are, you are Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And he says, well done, Peter. Flesh and blood hasn't revealed that to you, but my Father in heaven and upon this rock, I build my church. I mean, he goes, he, he gives Peter major commendation. And then he begins to say, now that you got it, let me tell you how I'm going to get there. It's not going to happen the way that you expected. I'm going to have to be crucified. I'm going to have to be betrayed. And the same Peter that just got commendation says, no, 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 not going to happen. I'm sorry, Jesus. I just got to tell you like it is and we're not going to let you do it. And he turns around, doesn't even call him Peter, doesn't even address him. He says, get behind me, Satan, because your mind is on the things of man instead of the things of God. P Peter never expected Jesus to go to the cross. This is why even when he was in the Garden of Gethsemane and the Roman soldiers come to, to arrest him, Peter pulls out the sword. I like it because at least when Peter is wrong, he's all the way wrong. You know, I mean, when he's on, he's on, and when he's off, he's all the way off. In the Garden of Gethsemane, he pulls that sword out and says, no, if you're going to get him, you're going to have to come through me. And Pe just cuts the ear off. And Jesus says, Peter, Peter, it's not, it's not, <laughs> come on now. Not like that, bruh. 
Peter's frustrated. He goes back fishing because things didn't turn out the way that he had expected them to. And can I tell you something? You don't really know hurt. You don't really know disappointment until you spe expect one thing and you get something totally different. You, you, don't, you don't really know hurt until you expect a raise, but you get nothing. You don't really know disappointment until you expect, expect to be recognized, but you get looked over. Or you expect to pat on the back and you ultimately get laid off. You expect fidelity and devotion to, to death do you part, and, and you don't get that. That's the definition of disappointment and frustration. And so Peter goes back to doing what he was doing before Jesus even came into his life because things didn't happen the way that he had expected them to. And I'm teaching to some of you tonight and that's exactly where you are. You expected something, but what you got was something totally different. But God brought me all the way here from Birmingham to tell you that here's the good news. Even though you expected something different, here's why you got to learn to give him a praise even in the midst of him doing something different because God rarely works things out the way we expected him to. He rarely does it, Bishop. He rarely does it. I figure this out. See, what we want is we want God to take us from no place to some place overnight. We want God to turn it around overnight. Mm -hmm. but, but that's not how God works. Well, some of you are saying, well, how, how do you know that, Pastor? I don't even know you. I don't know if I can trust this. Well, well, I know this because there's a pattern in Scripture that God has established that shows us how God would not only work in the lives of the Old Testament figures, but also in the lives of New Testament figures and in our life as well. There's a pattern in Scripture. Can I show you what that pattern is? The, the pattern goes like this. Out of Egypt, through the wilderness, into the promised land. I said it too fast. Here's the pattern. Out of the wilderness, I mean out of Egypt, through the wilderness, into the promised land. Y'all not talking to me over here. Can I give you the pattern again? Out of Egypt, here's a pattern. Through the wilderness, into the promised land. I know where I am. I got some Bible readers in the house. Some of you are thinking, but what about Deuteronomy 6.23 that he brought us out to bring us in? Yes. But before you go in, guess what you're going to go? You're going to come out. You're going to go through. Then you're going to go in. He, he did it. He did it for the nation of Israel. He did it for the nation of Israel. Brought them out of Egypt. But then the Bible says that he intentionally didn't take them uh, the short route. He took them through the wilderness in order to bring them in to the land. He did it for them. He did it for Jesus. Did, did it for Jesus. Jesus, Jesus comes, comes out of the water being baptized by John the Baptist the heavens open and a voice uh, sounds from heaven and says that this is my son in whom I'm well pleased he comes out of the water and then the Bible says that the spirit not the enemy y'all missed that one the spirit drives him into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil then he comes out of the wilderness then he comes into his ministry. That's when he begins to heal. That's when he begins to deliver. That's when he begins to move in miraculous fashion. And, and, and Luke 4 and 14, if you're, if you're taking notes, write this down. In Luke 4 and 14, it says that Jesus returned in the power of the Spirit into Galilee. This is after the wilderness. So where does the power come from? He returned in power. Where does the power come from? It comes from the wilderness. I think I lost you. Okay. Bishop, we love to call Acts 1 and 8. And after that, ye shall receive power when the Holy Ghost comes upon you. We, we love to quote it, but we don't ask the question, God, what do you mean after that? It's after your wilderness. You do know that there was 40 days in between the resurrection, the ascension, and the day of Pentecost, don't you? Because what were the disciples doing in that upper room when they were praying, waiting on the Holy Ghost? It was a 40-day period of wilderness wandering. Ooh. 
Yeah, see, he says, he says, he says, after that, and I think I lost some of you, some of you back up. Mm. Jesus is the pattern son. I got some help here, Bishop. Jesus is the pattern son. First Peter says that he is our example in all things, which means that the way that God worked in his life is the way that God is going to work in our life. Meaning, guess what? Don't panic. You're just going through your wilderness. And when you come out, you're going to come into something, but you're going to come out with greater power. You just missed it. Okay. Um, part of the reason that there's so little power in the body of Christ is because nobody wants to go through the wilderness. We talk about power, but we don't operate in it. Okay, let me back up. I'm sorry. Um, Deuteronomy chapter 8 and verse 2. Deuteronomy 8 and 2. Here's what God tells Moses to tell the nation of Israel. He says, remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years? Why? Why? To humble you mm -hmm. and test you in order to know what was in your heart. Here's the clincher. And whether or not you would keep his commands. God says, I have to take you through the wilderness for a reason. Why? Because it's in the wilderness that you demonstrate your faith. Yeah. It's in the wilderness that you show God that I depend on you more than people. It's in the wilderness that you develop a devotional life. It's in a wilderness that you really learn what praise and worship is all about. You don't need an organist. You don't need a choir. You, you don't need a minister of music in the wilderness. You know how to learn. You raise your own hymns, sing your own song, raise your own offering, tell them thank you, Jesus, wipe your own tears, and shout all around your closet by yourself in the wilderness. In the wilderness. He says, I had to take you through the wilderness to see whether or not you keep my commandments. M meaning that you get the commands on Sunday. <laughs> and God says, so then I got to set up some wilderness time on Monday and Tuesday and Wednesday. I got to put the problematic people around you because that's your opportunity to walk in what you just learned on Sunday. Okay, all right. Let me say it another way. Uh, I love this. Jesus says in Matthew 16 and verse 24. He said to Matthew 16 and 24, watch this. He says, whoever wants to be my disciples, yeah. you, you must deny yourself. Take up your cross and follow me. He says, that's wilderness language. He says, if you're going to be my disciple, if you're going to follow me, you got to take up your cross. You got to deny yourself. You got to follow me. Here's, here's the thing about the cross. I'm looking for a cross in here. Here's the thing about the cross. When the cross, when the cross is in a stationary position, the cross is an addition symbol. Mm -hmm. when, when the cross is in a stationary position, it's an addition symbol. Mm -hmm. But if you're going to take up your cross, the cross shifts when you put it on your back. You ever seen somebody carrying the cross? When they carry the cross, they don't carry it like it's an addition symbol. When you put it on your back, it shifts and it becomes a multiplication symbol. What I'm trying to tell somebody tonight is you've been praying for increase and multiplication and he says, you don't even know that I'm getting ready to give it to you, but you got to take up your cross. You got to take up your cross. Increase supernatural breakthrough it's coming but it comes on the backside of the wilderness Woo! so so Peter Peter Peter's forgotten this Peter Peter's struggling because he says let me let me just go back let me just go back. This is too problematic for me. I'm sick of dealing with people and, and stuff. And, and I can't believe that they call themselves a Christian and they did what they did. And I, let, me just, let, me, let me just go back. And, and then, you know, and I think Jesus in, in, in his wise providence, in him being fully human and fully divine, he knew that Peter was going to go through this. Because if you remember earlier in Luke 22 and verse 31, Jesus says to Peter, he says, Simon, Simon, there it is again. 
he says, he says, Satan, Satan, Satan asked to sift you like wheat. Mm -hmm. But I prayed for you, Simon, that your faith not fail. And when you've turned back, strengthen your brothers. Notice that Jesus doesn't say, I'm going to take you out because there's a purpose to the wilderness. He says, Simon, Simon, Satan has asked to sift you like wheat. But he doesn't say, I'm going to take you out. I'm going to prevent it from happening. He just simply says, but I prayed for you. <laughs> he says, yeah, you're going to have to go through the wilderness, bro. But I prayed for you. I prayed for you. He says, Satan has asked to, to sift you. I, my grandmother went to glory several years ago. And my grandmother was an amazing cook, and, and I, I used to love going over grandma's house Sunday afternoon. That was what we did growing up. We went to grandma's house, and uh, she, she, I think I was her favorite. I, I have to find out when we get to glory. I think I was, but, but, but she would always, she would make a marble cake for me. That's my favorite cake, you know, the chocolate vanilla swirl. She would make the marble cake. And I used to love to go into the kitchen long before the cake was made because, because when she was really in a good way, you know, she would let me lick the bowl and, and lick the beaters. Anybody know what I'm talking about? I don't know. Yeah, she would let me lick the beaters, you know. Um, but when she was preparing the cake, she used to have this old school sifter. It was that, that silver, it had the little, it was bent up, you know, all banged up, you know, had the handle, had a little crank on the side, you know, and she would, she would put the flour in the top, and then she would, and what would happen is, is the large clumps, the substantial stuff would be caught in the top, and the light stuff would fall to the bottom. Simon, Simon, Satan asked to, some of you wondering, what's the shaking been about? Satan's trying to sift you. He's trying to separate you from what he knows you're getting ready to step into. Why have I been going through what I've been going through? It's just the enemy. But then Jesus says, but I prayed for you. I prayed for you. And when you turn back, Y'all went to sleep on me over here. Not and if. And when you turn back. God's got more confidence in some of you than you have in yourself. God is not up in heaven twiddling his thumb saying, I hope they come through. He said, no, I know who my baby is. I know, I know what I put in them. Greater is he that is within you than he that is within the world. He says, so they may be shaken now, but when they come out of this, he says, strengthen your brothers. <laughs> he says, Peter, you're going through something, and what you're going through is not just about you. What you're going through is about everybody that's connected to you. So when you come out, Peter, what I need you to know is that it's not just you that's coming out. It's everybody connected to you. God, I feel that in the Holy Ghost. Touch somebody and tell them, when I come out of this wilderness, everybody connected to me is coming out. This struggle is not just about me. It's about my baby. It's about generations coming after me. My whole family's coming. Bishop, I heard the Lord say that if the church would just be the church and just step up, everybody's like, oh, yeah, what's, what's going to happen with the church? This is, this is a bad time. This is not a bad time. The world is waiting mm, on the church to stand up. And when the church stands up, everything connected to it is getting ready to come out. I'm sorry. By my own time, let me hurry up. Hey. Woo, it's a struggle to not go back. Touch somebody, say, don't go back. Let me give you this last point. And then I'm going to get out of your way. Am I okay, Bishop, on time? It, it's, it's a struggle. It's a struggle of your will. You're in a struggle for greatness. First part of the struggle is a struggle to not go back. Don't, don't go back. There's nothing back there for you. But the second thing is, it's a struggle of your will. Because let me tell you what Peter's really wrestling with on a psychological level. Peter is saying, no, wait a minute, now I left my business. I left my occupation as a fisherman to be part of this ministry thing, Jesus, and um, you're gone. 
And uh, it was your ministry that took care of us. Yeah, see, don't let anybody fool you into thinking that Jesus was a beggar and that he was broke. And I'm not, I'm not a prosperity guy, I'm not, I'm, you know, because I believe that God wants us to be whole in every area, not just one area. So I don't teach just one part of the Bible, I teach the whole Bible. But, but I want you to understand that it is a lie from the pit of hell for, for people to think that Jesus was broke and that the disciples were broke. That, that's not Bible. It's not Bible. First question is, why in the world do you need a treasurer if you don't have any money? Come on, Judas was a treasurer. All of them, all of them were entrepreneurs and business owners. If I had more time, I would go into that and teach that. But the Bible even says that beyond them, there were wealthy women that were the patrons, that, that, that were the underwriters of Jesus' ministry. And so Jesus' ministry took care of them. But not only did the ministry take care of them, it was the ministry that promised a bonus. Okay. I got to go to Bible on this one. Luke, Luke 18, verse 29. Write this in your margin so you can study it when you get home. Luke 18, beginning around verse 29. This is on the backside of the rich young ruler. The rich young ruler comes warning up to Jesus and says, what must I do to inherit eternal life? Jesus says, go sell everything that you have. And, and you'll get it. And the Bible says that he walked away real slow because he had many things. Many of us misunderstand that passage. Jesus was not saying you can't have things. He's just saying he didn't want the things to have you. And so the rich young ruler leaves, puts his head down, walks away. And here's real Peter again. Peter says, uh, 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 um, uh, Jesus. I got to ask you a question because we just saw that whole exchange. And so the question is, what are we going to get? This is, this, is, this, is, this is what Peter asked. He says, uh, I just want to know because we left stuff too now. I mean, I'm just saying. It's been in your Bible the whole time. He says, for real. So, so, so what are we going to get? And here's what Jesus responds. This is Luke 18 verse 29. He said to them, assuredly I say to you, there's no one who's left house or parents or brothers or wives or children for the sake of the kingdom of God who shall not receive many times more in this present time and in the age to come eternal life you missed it so he's saying before you start talking about I'm gonna get a robe you're gonna get a robe all God's children gonna get a robe when I get to heaven I'm gonna put on my robe and I'm he said whoa, 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 whoa. before you start talking about pie in the sky when you get the glory Please know that he promised some stuff right now in this day. Oh, I wish I could teach it like I feel it. Look at somebody and tell him he promised to bless me. He promised to bless me. Oh, blessed folk, let me tell you something. Can I just give you something that's going to set you free tonight? Stop hiding your blessings. I'm not giving you a license to be arrogant and prideful. That's not the word of God either. But stop hiding your stuff. Uh, okay, y'all know how we do. You get something new and God's blessed you with it. Oh, that's a beautiful dress. Oh, this whole thing. It ain't nothing. Hey, you know, I'm just a sinner saved by grace. No. Enjoy what God has done in your life. I'm, this is liberating for somebody. Go on your vacation enjoy it and when you have haters i'm like well how dare you tell them you don't know what i gave up to go up hmm. <laughs> folk want to be you but they haven't gone through your wilderness and so tell them i get i got this because i came through some stuff through many dangers tolls and snares i have well how, how dare you ask them what are you willing to give up you got to give something up if you're willing to go up. But, but, but now, but now, but now, but now that Jesus is gone, the money's dried up. Peter, Peter says, now, wait, wait, wait a minute, wait, wait a minute, wait a minute, what a minute. What, what am I going to do? What am I going to do for money? What am I going to do for, for my livelihood? What am I going to do for my family? 
And what Peter decides to do is the wrong thing. He decides to take matters into his own hands and to go back to doing what he was doing before. And the Bible says that they fished all night long and they caught nothing. They worked hard. They were sincere. They were just sincerely wrong. They wanted to catch something. I hear that in the spirit. You're very sincere, but you're sincerely wrong. They wanted to catch something, but they went about it the wrong way. And that's where some of you are tonight. You're like, how is he reading my mail? It's the Holy Spirit. And can I tell you the truth of the matter is some of us really need to praise God that we didn't catch anything. I'm not going to get any praise right here. Anybody can praise God when he does stuff. But some of us need to praise God that we didn't catch anything because we sure enough went back. We went back looking. And it is the blessing of God that you didn't catch anything. Because whatever you would have caught outside of his will wouldn't have lasted anyway. And so I love it, Bishop, because they, 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 um, they, they, they've been fishing all night. I love it. And Jesus, Jesus just, Jesus shows up. He says, he says, uh, he asks a rhetorical question. He says, uh, hey, hey, ha have you caught anything? He, it's a rhetorical question. But w because what he's trying to remind them is what he taught us in John, that, that I am the vine and you are the branches. Cut off from me. You can do nothing. He's trying to remind them of what he said and what his word uh, said, what Apostle Paul wrote down in 1 Corinthians, that in Adam all men die, but in Christ all men live. He says, hey, 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 hey do, you, do you have anything? Did you catch something? Hey, how, how's it going? <laughs> and, and the disciples, you know, they got an attitude. They're like, no. No, we, we, didn't, we, didn't, we, didn't, we didn't catch anything. Why? Because going back to lesser things is beneath you who is this for you got an anointing on your life for great things but you got to stop playing footsies with lesser things and step into your identity who am i teaching to he says oh oh have you caught anything they, 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 they say no he says um just a thought But throw your nets on the right side of the boat. Just a matter of inches. What's the difference between breakdown and breakthrough? Just, 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 just a matter of inches was the difference between having it all and having nothing. It, it has been said that six inches is just the difference in the distance between your mind and your heart. Could, could it be that God has already done it in here, but he's trying to just travel six inches to do it here? He, he, he says, just throw your nets on the right side of the boat. He doesn't say move the boat. doesn't say move the boat you're in the right boat i'm teaching to somebody tonight it's like well if i can just move up to, to trenton if i could just move to newark if i can move to atlanta if i can just get out of this marriage and get into the next marriage you're in the right boat the problem is not your boat the problem is you if he can just move you how do you know pastor that i'm in the right boat because you don't judge your situation by what it looks like on the surface you judge it by what God says about it. I just lost you. You don't judge your situation by what it looks like. You judge your situation by what God says about it. What does God say? Uh, come here, Ezekiel. I need you to tell your story. Well, one day God sent me into a valley of dry bones. And he asked me a question. He said, son of man, can these bones live? He said, I've been around the block a couple of times, Bethany. So, so I didn't even try to answer the question. I just... Lifted it back up to the Lord. I said, oh, Lord, you know. But then God told me something that was very strange. He said, Ezekiel, prophesy to the bones. Don't, don't talk about how messed up they are. 
but talk about what they can be because there's power in your mouth I remember the word says that when it goes out it will never return void so when I began to, to, to prophesy to speak life to the bones there was a shaking oh I feel that I don't know who this is for stop complaining and telling them what they're not begin to prophesy in the atmosphere of what it could be you ought to just go in your child's room when you get home lay hands on them and say I speak it in the name of Jesus you will be healed you will be intelligent you will be taught of the Lord in Jesus name you ought to go home and touch your crazy husband and say I love you and there's nothing you can do about it Jesus in the name of Jesus heal his body touch his mind speak to what it can be not what it looks like to you some of you are getting ready to go from lack to abundance because it's not your job it's not the surrounding he's trying to move you some of you getting ready to sh I feel a shifting a shifting in your entire life you're getting ready to step in stuff that's been waiting on you the entire time you just had to get your mind right. Somebody just felt a click. That's it. You just, God's been trying to get your mind right. Just move to the other side of the boat. And watch this. Watch this. Watch this. Ooh, I'm trying to hurry up. Can I tell you, this is why you don't play around when you come to worship? Yes, that's it. That's it. This is why you don't play when you come to worship. I hear this. In, this is why you don't play when you come to worship. You, you don't come to worship for what you got on or what somebody else has got on and what somebody else is trying. You don't come to worship for that. You come to worship because one word can shift you. You come to worship because in that atmosphere, God begins to do things that will literally change destinies. And he says, he says, throw your nets on the right side of the boat. And they haul in a catch so large that they almost couldn't handle it oh i hear this for somebody tonight you're getting ready to step into unprecedented blessings and it's going to be easy there's been a period where you've had to work hard mm -hmm. but you had to work hard because you were working out of your flesh but now you're getting ready to let god drive and you oh god i hear this this is why the priests had to wear linen undergarments because their work was not supposed to make them sweat okay y'all catch that Tuesday mm-hmm yeah um uh they get a catch so big that they can barely haul it in Whoo! and can I tell you what God is looking for Bishop notice notice that there are three types of responses to Jesus there are three types of responses because watch this watch this there, there are some disciples who stood on the shore right whether when Jesus was on the shore they they they, they saw him but the Bible says they didn't recognize him yeah they, they saw him but they didn't recognize him mm -hmm. then there was the, the one that, that Jesus loved we're talking about John and John said it is the Lord but he didn't move hmm. but it was Peter then when he recognized that it was Jesus, started taking off stuff and jumped in the water. Bishop, I hear the Lord saying, don't worry about the folk who've been around for a very long time, but they don't even recognize Jesus. There's some people that can walk with him for three and a half years. And when he shows up, they won't even recognize him. Then there's some people that will say, that's the Lord right there, but they won't move oh that's good preaching right there oh 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 God was showing sure up in that place today but they won't move what God is looking for are the folk who say if I got to come out of this robe if I got to come out of this stuff I'll come out of whatever I got to come out of <laughs> because there's a wave of God moving and I'm going to jump in I'm not going to try to control it I'm going to swim in it Who, who am I teaching to tonight? And when they get to the shore, whoo, when, when they get there, let me just leave this thing alone. When they get there, 
what they had been fishing all night for was waiting on them. The fish was already waiting on them. Who am I teaching to? You've been trying to go about it your own way. But if you will just surrender to the Lordship of Jesus Christ, everything you need, he has. He is the great I am. It's already there. They've been working all night for something that they had access to the whole time. And what I love about Jesus and his grace, he says, he says, bring some of what you called. Br bring some of what you called. Bring some of what you called. Because, because what God will do is he will let you have some reminders that you went about it and tried it your way and it didn't work out too tough. Anybody ever, you, you got some of those reminders? You can think back over your life and you're like, oh, yeah, I'm, I see, I will never do that again. That's God's way of saying, you tried it your way. You see where it got you? Now come on in and do it my way. They, they get to the shore. I'm closing. They get to the shore. I feel this. I, I just want to say this. I told you this is answer prayer. This is kind of prophetic. They get to the shore. They get to the, they get to the shore. And the, and, the, and the fish is already laid out on the coals. It's already laid out. Then wait a minute. Then there's bread. Oh. There's, there's bread. Wait, and, and there's, wait a minute. There's fish. Wait, okay, wait a minute. There's bread. Jesus said, I am the bread of life. There's bread and there's fish. Follow me and I will make you fishers of... Okay, so there, there's bread. Okay, okay. Oh, wait a minute. This reminds us of communion as he brings them together he's saying y'all went back and you went and tried to do it your way but remember the whole reason i came was so that my body and my blood could be shed and and he's literally showing us that around that table because everybody was around that table it wasn't just people that looked like jesus it wasn't people that that they liked it was different kinds of people there were zealots there were tax collectors there, there there were people that would betray him there were so many different types of people around that table what what you're getting ready to step into is a season where god is going to do more but he's going to do it through people that are going to be unexpected every see you've been trying to stay in your one group and in your one click but what Jesus is trying to show you is that I went to the cross not just for you. I went to the cross for everybody. And so, there's the bread and there's the fish. But wait a minute, wait a minute. This is reminding me of something. I got to share this with you before I close. There's the bread. There's the fish. That's communion. But wait a minute. There's, some, there's a bread and there's the fish. Oh. Jesus was teaching one day and the teaching was so good that they had been there all day and there was about 5,000 men not counting women and children and Jesus had been teaching he'd just been in a vein and he'd been teaching all day and the disciples come up to him and they said uh, Jesus I'm sorry uh, we're not trying to interrupt interrupt the tent revival but um, but uh, but uh, this is a remote place and, and there's, there's not, not anywhere close for the people to go and get food. So, so Jesus, great word, by the way, Jesus, great word. But, but um, great word, but, uh, you, but great word, but you, you got to kind of bring it to a close. Because the folk got to go somewhere and eat, man. Jesus just says, well, y'all feed them. And he keeps teaching. Oh. I don't know who it was. They had the conversation, but they run back to the disciples. The disciples say, well, what, 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 what did he say? And, and, he, and they say, well, he said, we, teach, we, we feed him. We, we can't feed him. We can't feed 5,000. We can't feed him. And how we can't do that. Go back and tell him. I, really? You want me to go back and tell him? Yeah, go back and tell him. So, okay, uh, Jesus, I love that point, by the way. That was a very unique take on Moses. I love that. Um, I'm sorry to interrupt again. I'm sorry. Uh, let me, I put my finger up, Jesus. I'm sorry. Um, um, I, yeah, I talked it over to the, to the fellows, and they said, we, there's no way we have enough to feed all of them. What do you have? Uh, listen, we, we really, really took inventory of what was around, and the most we could scrounge together, this little boy, I guess his mama was concerned, and so he, she packed a couple of pieces of fish 
There it is. And some loaves of bread. That's all we got. He says, well, well, here, you make them sit down. You make them sit down. And bring what you have to me. Now, here's what I want to tell you because I'm closing with this. One of the greatest mistakes we make in that passage is we think that Jesus multiplied the fish and the bread. He didn't do it. They bring the lunch. A couple of pieces of fish, a few loaves of bread. They bring it to Jesus, and here's what Jesus does. He takes it. Mm -hmm. He blesses it. He breaks it. Then he gives it to the disciples. And as, and as they're walking around, somewhere in between them handing out the sandwich and going back in the bucket, it continues to multiply. So every time they give it and they reach for more of it, it multiplies. Ah, oh, you missed it. Mm. So now Jesus has them on the shore. Woo! And he's what, he, what he's trying to remind them is of that episode because it's a picture, y'all, of what God is going to do in your life. Some of you have been crying out, God, why? God says, because did you learn the lesson? I'm going to first take you. I'll take you from some people. I can take you from some stuff. I got to take you from your comfort zone. Once I take you, then I can bless you. But once I bless you, hold up. Don't get too excited because after the blessing comes the. But I got to break you so that I could give you. I, I said it too fast. Some of you have been praying for increase. Some of you have been praying that God would literally open the windows of heaven to pour you out blessings. You have a room enough to receive. It's happening, but here's the process. He's going to take you. He's going to bless you. Then he's going to. But he's only going to break you so he can give you. Oh, yeah, yeah. Let me see if you got it. He, he's going to take you. He's going to. But then after he blesses you, he's going to. So he can give you. You're getting ready to move Bethany into a whole new dimension of man influence and and power and favor. But it's not gonna happen the way you thought it was gonna happen. You thought it was gonna be smooth sailing. <laughs> it's really smooth, but God has got to do the work first in you. So can I describe what's been happening recently? If this is gonna be your best year yet, but the process is you first gotta be. Given, blessed, broken. Thank you. He's going to. Then he's going to. So Jesus was literally saying, Peter, you're overreacting, man. I showed you the pattern. I had to take you so that I could bless you. I had to bless you so I could break you. And I had to break you so I could give you. Can I give you a sneak peek of where you're going? This is why when you fast forward to Acts on the day of Pentecost, when the Holy Ghost falls and they say these men are drunk, Peter says, uh -uh -uh -uh. we are not drunk as you suppose. There's a special anointing on him now. There's a power now. He can preach and thousands will be saved. There's a power on him that folk just want to get close to his shadow. Because when they get close to his shadow, they're healed. But it never would have happened if he didn't allow God to first. Then. Ultimately, the So he could. Come on, give God a praise up in here. Give him a praise like you really mean it. Somebody needs to praise him like, I got it now, God. Thank you for everything you've taken me through. Thank you for reminding me.
Every time you come to this table, every time you eat of the bread, drink of the wine, it's not just about the salvation power of Jesus. It's a picture of what God does in all of our lives. Except a seed fall to the ground and die, it abides alone. This is why when Peter said, Jesus, you can't go to the cross, he says, I have to go. Because, because God takes us, he blesses us, then he breaks us to ultimately give us. I, I want to do one thing if that's okay. I, first of all, I don't want to take for granted, I, I've enjoyed my time of sharing the word with you. But I don't want to take for granted that everybody here, that they're where they need to be in God. So I want to give you an opportunity to do that and then I want to be a blessing to the house. I didn't come to get anything, I came to be a blessing because I know the power of sowing. And when you sow, I'm telling you, God will move. So, I first of all, every head bowed, every eye closed. Stand with me if you don't mind. If you're physically able, stand with me. Every head bowed, every eye closed. I want to be able to see you. And I want you to be honest with me and with the Lord. The only person looking at you right now is me, Jesus, and the bishop. For a lot of my life, I was in church, but I was not in the Lord. See, I... David said, I was glad when they said unto me. That was my, not my testimony as a kid. My testimony was I was sad when they said unto me. Because I didn't have an option. Mama made me go. So I was in church. But I wasn't in God. But, but when I really got in God, when, when I allowed him in my heart, my whole life changed. And I want to tell you something. I am not ashamed of the gospel of Jesus Christ. And I don't want you to be ashamed. So with every head bowed, every eye closed, I just want to ask you to raise your hand and acknowledge that, that this is for you. If you're here today, and maybe you don't know Jesus, if you're here today, and maybe you've given your life to him, but you don't have a church home, or here's a big one. This is why I ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes. If you're in church, but as I was teaching, something began to happen, and it was, it was your word, because you're in church, but you're not in him. And you want to really surrender your life, all of your life, not just to compartmentalize your relationship with the Lord, but to give him all of you. If that is you, if you're in any one of those categories, I'd love an opportunity to pray for you. If you're in any one of those categories, every head bowed, every eye closed, just slip your hand up. Just slip your hand up. If you're in any one of those categories, just slip your hand up. I see you. Just slip your hand up. I see you. Slip your hand up. If you're in any one of those categories, I don't have a relationship with the Lord, don't have a church home, or I do, but I need to really just rededicate my life and start over with Jesus. Every hand up if that's you. I want to make sure I want to count it. Every hand up if that's you. Every hand up. Every hand up. One, two, three, four, five. Put it up high so I can see you. Six. Father, right now, in the name of Jesus, you can drop those hands. Father, I thank you for this word. I thank you for those six hands or so that have just gone up to connect with you in a very real way. And Lord, I, I pray that as you've done it in my life, I pray that you would do it in theirs, that you would come into their hearts, that you would take residence in them, that you would fill them with your precious spirit, and that you would tag them and then put them on the path that you have for them, a path to bring them into their best place. I thank you that the rest of their life is literally going to be the best of their life because they've fully surrendered to you on tonight. And Father, their next steps are to follow the process of this great church and to get ingrained in the culture of this church and to not just go through membership class, but to get involved and to serve and to help make a difference. And I, I pray that for them right now in the name of Jesus. I thank you, Lord, that everything connected to them is going to be impacted by this decision. And Father, I give you praise honor and glory for it now in Jesus name we pray those who agree say amen, amen. come on would you give God praise for those decisions as you take your seats